Sexuality and Spirituality by M. Scott Peck, read by Vincent Bagnall. The notion that there is a relationship between sexuality and spirituality is shocking to some people, at least to those who have never read the Song of Solomon in the Bible, which begins, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. This Song of Songs, as it is more properly titled, is an exquisite erotic duet between God and his or her people. There is, however, a particular brand of religion that identifies sex and sexuality with the devil, who supposedly tempts us with lust and the sinful pleasures of the flesh. In that context, the only possible relationship there can be between sexuality and spirituality is one of war in which one side must win out over the other. But my own view is that insofar as there is conflict between sexuality and spirituality, it is more in the nature of a lover's quarrel or a sibling rivalry, both of which, to some extent, can be outgrown. If we begin by asking what sexuality is, right away we run into a scientific stone wall. Here at the end of the 20th century, we know how to blow ourselves off the face of the earth, but we can't even begin, from a scientific point of view, to understand what the non-anatomical differences or similarities are between men and women. I'm afraid that mythology once again has much more to tell us about the nature of sexuality than does our science. One of the basic themes in mythology is fear on the part of the gods that human beings are becoming like them. And the myth of sexuality is a variant of this same theme. This myth tells us that at the beginning, human beings were androgynous, unified creatures. But as such, they were rapidly gaining in power and were about to encroach upon the gods. So the gods split human beings into halves, male and female. And as half-creatures, we were no longer capable of competing with the gods. Yet we were also left feeling incomplete, yearning for our lost wholeness, forever searching for our other half, hoping that in the moment of sexual union with our other half, we might re-experience the lost bliss of our near godlike totality. So, at least according to the myth, our sexuality arises out of a sense of incompleteness and is manifested by an urge toward wholeness and a yearning for the Godhead. But what is our spirituality if not the same thing? What is our spirituality if not something that arises out of a sense of incompleteness and is manifested by an urge toward wholeness and a yearning for the Godhead. Sexuality and spirituality are not, of course, exactly the same thing. They are not identical twins, but they are kissing cousins, and they arise out of the same kind of ground, not only in myth, but in actual human experience. The fact is that sex is the closest that many people ever come to a spiritual experience. Indeed, it is because it is a spiritual experience of sorts that so many chase after it with a repetitive, desperate kind of abandon. Often, whether they know it or not, they're searching for God. It is no accident that even atheists and agnostics will, at the moment of orgasm, routinely cry out, Oh, God! Orgasm is a mystical experience. The great psychologist Abraham Maslow one day decided, instead of studying sick people, to study particularly healthy people. The one in 10,000 who seem to have gotten most of it together, who seem to have fulfilled their potential, become most fully human. These he called self-actualized people. And personally, I would prefer the term co-actualized. Studying them, he discerned some 13 things they had in common. And one of them was that they routinely experienced orgasm as a spiritual, even mystical event. Now again, that word mystical is more than an analogy. Throughout the ages, mystics have spoken of an ego death, 
as a necessary part of a spiritual mystical journey, or even as the goal, the end of the mystical journey itself. And you may know that the French have traditionally referred to orgasm as la petite mort, or the little death. The subjective duality of the orgasmic experience is, of course, highly dependent on the quality of the relationship of the partners involved. So, if it is the best possible orgasm you're after, then the best way to achieve it is with someone who is deeply beloved to you. But while a relationship with a beloved other is necessary to bring us to the very highest mystical heights of the orgasmic experience, once we reach those heights, we actually lose the awareness of our partner. At that brief peak point of little death, we forget who and where we are. And in a very real sense, I think this is because we have left this earth and entered God's country. As Ananda Kumaraswamy put it, at the moment of mutual climax, each, as individuals, has no more significance to the other than the gates of heaven for the one within. Or, as Joseph Campbell paraphrased it, when one has lost oneself in the rapture of love, the partner is of no more importance than the portals of the temple through which one has passed to the altar. So, the sexual experience is potentially religious. Is the religious experience sexual? I don't believe it is an accident that throughout history most of the very best erotic poetry has been written by monks and nuns. You may already be familiar with the famous Dark Night poem of St. John of the Cross. One dark night, fired with love's urgent longings, ah, the sheer grace, I went out unseen, my house being now all still. In darkness and secure, by the secret ladder, disguised. Ah, the sheer grace in darkness and concealment, my house being now all stilled. On that glad night, in secret, for no one saw me, nor did I look at anything, with no other light or guide than the one that burned in my heart. This guided me more surely than the light of noon to where he was waiting for me. Him I know so well. There in a place where no one appeared. Note the mixing of the sexes in this next stanza. O oh, guiding night! O oh, night more lovely than the dawn! O oh, night that has united the lover with his beloved! transforming the beloved in her lover. Upon my flowering breast, which I kept holy for him alone, there he lay sleeping, and I caressing him there in a breeze from the fanning cedars. When the breeze blew from the turret, as I parted his hair, it wounded my neck with its gentle hand, suspending all my senses. I abandoned and forgot myself, laying my face on my beloved. All things ceased. I went out from myself, leaving my cares forgotten among the lilies. I believe that the final stanza of this poem, which describes the mystical union possible between human beings, and God is also a, as fine a description of orgasm as anything in literature. I abandoned and forgot myself. All things ceased. I went out from myself. I have learned in my encounters with monks and nuns that the best monk or nun is someone who loves God the most passionately. And in order to love God passionately, one has to be a passionate sexual person. How is it, then, that just such people choose chastity or celibacy? There are two reasons. The first, if you will pardon the pun, is that sex can screw up relationships. As soon as we make a sexual object of another person, there is a profound tendency to use him or her. Although we've got somewhat differing masculine and feminine styles of doing this, we each have a tendency to use 
the sex object in our lives in ways that are covertly, if not overtly, manipulative and self-serving. Now, there have been experiments with non-celibate convents and monasteries, but thus far they have all been failures. Therefore, those who firmly resolve to relate with their fellow human beings in an unfailingly healing fashion usually decide that a highly restrained sexuality, such as celibacy or chastity, is the price they must pay, and often they find the price well worth it. The Illusion of Romantic Love in The Road Less Traveled, I drew a sharp distinction between love, which I defined as concern for the spiritual growth of another, and romantic love, which I have come to understand as a form of narcissism. The whole American ideal of romantic love holds that it ought to be somehow possible for Cinderella to ride off with her prince into the sunset of endless orgasms. It is an illusion. Romantic love is preferable to what preceded it in history, namely a culture of marriage by arrangement. But nonetheless, anyone who believes that permanent romance in a relationship is a perpetual possibility is doomed to perpetual disappointment. In fact, it is the search for God in human romantic relationships that is, I think, one of the greatest problems we have in this and other cultures. What we do is to look to our spouse or lover to be a God unto us. We look to our spouse or lover to meet all our needs, to fulfill us, to bring us a lasting heaven on earth, and it never works. And among the reasons it never works, whether or not we're aware when we do this, is that we are violating the first commandment, which says, I am the Lord, thy God, and thou shalt not have any other gods before me. It is, however, also very natural that we should do this. It is very natural to want to have a tangible God, one whom we can not only see and touch, but also hold and embrace and sleep with and perhaps even possess. So we keep looking to our spouse or lover to be a God unto us. And in the process, we forget about the true God. Thus, the other reason the profoundly religious so often choose celibacy is that they do not want to be distracted from their love of God. They do not want to fall prey to the idolatry of human romantic love. They know that, as St. Augustine said, You made us for yourself, dear Lord, and we cannot find true rest except in you. And that it is possible, if their number one relationship is with God, that they may not need to seek another. The sexiness of spirituality. It is not my intent to make an impassioned plea for celibacy as a necessity for spiritual growth. On the contrary, I celebrate not only sexuality, but sex. I like sex, and I like other people to have sex. About a dozen years ago, after many months of working with a rigid, frigid woman in her mid-thirties, I had the opportunity to witness her undergo a sudden and quite profound Christian conversion. And within three weeks of that conversion, she became orgasmic for the first time in her life. Could the timing have been accidental? I doubt it. As a friend of mine once put it, the sexual and the spiritual parts of our personality lie so close together that it is hardly possible to arouse one without arousing the other. I do not think it an accident that when this woman became able to give herself wholeheartedly to God, in very short order, she became able to give herself wholeheartedly to a human partner. Praise the Lord. I have another friend, a priest, who actually uses this phenomenon as a yardstick of conversion. He tells me that if a conversion occurs in a previously sexually repressed individual and is not accompanied by some kind of sexual awakening or blossoming, then he has reason to doubt the depth of the conversion. So... It is that you hear stories about ministers who become involved with female parishioners. Ministers and other people in similar positions tend to be sitting ducks when such passions are aroused. And I will confess that when I was practicing psychotherapy, any time I got on the same spiritual wavelength with a female patient of mine under the age of 90, I had to watch my step. The Universal Problem 
Sex is a problem for everyone. Sex is a problem for children. Sex is a problem for adolescents. Sex is a problem for young adults. Sex is a problem for middle-aged adults. Sex is a problem for elderly adults. Sex is a problem for celibates. Sex is a problem for married people. Sex is a problem for single people. Sex is a problem for straight people. Sex is a problem for gay people. Sex is a problem for bricklayers and plumbers. Sex is a problem for dentists and lawyers. Sex is a problem for surgeons and therapists and psychiatrists, and sex is a problem for Scott Peck. In my vision of this world, as a kind of celestial boot camp, replete with obstacles that have been almost fiendishly designed for our learning, of all the obstacles that God designed for our learning, I think the one that he or she most fiendishly designed is sex. God built us into a feeling that we can solve the problem of sex and be forever sexually fulfilled, that we can get over the obstacle. Indeed, for a couple of weeks or a couple of months or maybe even for a couple of years, if we're lucky, we may feel that we have solved the problem of sex. But then, of course, we change or our partners change or the whole ball game changes. And once again, we are left trying to scramble over that obstacle with this built-in feeling that we can get over it when actually we never can. However, in the process of trying to get over it, we learn a great deal about vulnerability and intimacy and love and how to whittle away at our narcissism. Some of us even get to graduate from boot camp. And if you involve God in the process, the chances of success improve. And to do that, you don't have to be a monk or a nun. I have come up with my own definition of celibacy and chastity. I arrived at these definitions thinking about the times when I was on the make. That is the appropriate expression because what I was trying to do was to make sex happen. I would have it all plotted out. I would take the woman who was the object of my desire out to dinner at a nice restaurant and then to a movie and then back to my apartment where I would have tapes and records all picked out and then we would go to bed. Now that's how I was going to make it happen. But contrary to my best laid plans, I actually couldn't make it happen. And occasionally, when I did, it wasn't a particularly great experience. Some of the most glorious sexual experiences I ever had, however, were the ones that not only seemed just to happen, but also seemed to be orchestrated by angels off in the wings, specifically, not by me. So I got to thinking that chastity maybe should be defined as a three-way relationship between two human beings and God, in which God is allowed to call the shots. Now, if you were to define chastity in that way, then there are a number of implications. One is that chastity is much harder than celibacy, which I define simply as the decision to refrain from sexual activity at least for a period of time. Another is that chastity is filled with traps because it's extraordinarily easy for us to convince ourselves that God wants us to do what we are doing. Still, another implication is that it is possible for premarital or extramarital sex to be quite chaste. And conversely, that it is possible for marital sex to be profoundly unchaste. When I was practicing psychotherapy, I sometimes suggested to married couples whose sex had gotten perfunctory that they might want to experiment with periods of chastity. Chastity and celibacy are two valid options for at least some people, and I think I would have made that suggestion even if I were a secular psychiatrist and not a religious one, because of several experiences I've had. Now, one was a number of years ago. I was working with a young woman, a PhD, schooled at the best universities, and among her many symptoms was a compulsive need to engage in sexual relationships which she neither desired nor enjoyed. We went through all the usual Freudian psychodynamics, trying to get to the root of this symptom without any success, until one day I asked her, you don't happen to believe, do you, that a very active sex life is a necessary part of mental health? And she said, well, of course. I mean, isn't that the way it is? Well, the poor woman felt that she had to compulsively engage in sexual relationships, which she neither desired nor enjoyed, simply to maintain an image of herself as mentally healthy. What an extraordinary relief it was for her when, after she had abstained from sex for three weeks, I gave her a certificate of mental health. I've seen the same phenomenon among elderly couples. 
in the past dozen years or so, there's been a whole spate of articles in the psychiatric and psychological literature saying that it is really pretty normal for elderly people to have sexual relationships. However, as with any kind of change in outlook, I'm always worried a little bit about the pendulum swinging too far. I am concerned that now that we uh, professionals have so graciously given the elderly permission to have sex, we may start telling them they should have it whether they like it or not in order to stay young or something. In the course of my career, I have run into two elderly couples who were deeply in love with each other, yet in both instances each partner confessed to me individually, in private, that he or she had lost sexual interest in the other, or in anyone else, for that matter. They were continuing to have a sexual relationship, however, because each felt that the other partner wanted it. So I got the two of them together, brought this out in the open, and suggested, since neither of you wants sex, why don't you stop? It was like a veritable revelation to them. They had never considered that it was all right to stop. I am reminded of that famous passage from Ecclesiastes, which begins, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And goes on to say, A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. This is profound secular as well as spiritual wisdom. Sex is a great gift. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it is a gift to be picked up by all people at all times, in all seasons. God and sex. In any discussion of sex, the notion of a sexual relationship between human beings and God is likely to be the most controversial and shocking. And when I think that almost everyone would accept that the most passionate relationships we can have with God are romantic ones, they would question whether sex or sexuality is actually involved. Most people would maintain that the erotic poetry of the Bible, or of people like St. John of the Cross, is no more than a poetic metaphor for a passionate spirituality. At most, they might agree with Alan Jones, who said that sexual love is a robust symbol of a yet more robust love. I think there is some truth in this, but I do not think it is the whole truth. Now, shocking as it may seem, I think there is a genuine sexual element in the relationship between human beings and God. What this means, if I'm correct, is not only that we human beings are sexual creatures, but also that God is in fact a sexual being. That's hardly what I've always believed. When I was in college, my favorite quote was one from Voltaire. If God created us in his own image, we have certainly returned the compliment. And nothing seemed more absurd to me than imagining God in anthropomorphic terms, as an old man with a long white beard or being with genitalia. It seemed to me that God must be infinitely different and infinitely more than we can possibly imagine him or her to be, and so he or she is. However, in the years since college, I've also come to realize that the very deepest means we have to even begin to comprehend something about the nature of God is through a projection onto him or her of the very best of our human nature, and that God, among other things, and above all other things, is humane. He represents humanity at its best, which has something to do with what is meant by God creating us in his own image. God as a seducer. I believe that God not only created us in his own image, but continues to do so, and I am indebted to the Episcopal theologian and author Robert Capon for pointing out the obvious logic that since God created us in his own image, and since we are sexual creatures, it might only stand to reason that God is a sexual being. Now, one reason that this syllogism makes sense to me, in addition to its logic, is that I have myself experienced God as a seducer. One reason that this syllogism makes sense to me, in addition to its logic, is that I myself have experienced God as a seducer. Substitute another word in your mind, like lover or wooer, if you will, but obviously God has succeeded in seducing me. 
although more often than not I have run away from him like a frightened, reluctant virgin. Once again, in Capon's words, this sexy god's love for us is profoundly seductive. He is a god who is continually on the make. God could have made sex as secular as breathing or eating, but instead he brushed it with a spiritual flavor. And he did this very deliberately, I think, in order to give us a taste for him. Because above all else, he wants to lure us to him. This notion of God, not only as a sexual being, but as a particularly seductive one, is perhaps somewhat supportive of our traditional masculine image of him. Certainly he does behave with an aggressiveness in the hunt that we have typically associated with males. I think this association itself is sexist, and I have met a few good huntresses in my time. But in any case, as Francis Thompson's famous poem, The Hound of Heaven, suggests, he chases after us with a vigor that is matched only by the vigor with which we may flee from him. And when we are finally caught, we may experience our conversion, as I suggested in The Road Less Traveled, not necessarily as an oh-joy phenomenon, but often as an oh-shit phenomenon, because we have been trapped, because we have been brought to bay, because we have finally and irrevocably been caught. And that's what it's all about. Not that he is male, not that she is female, he or she is both and more, but that he is after us, that he wants us, that he loves us beyond belief, and that he intends to have us, no matter how fast and far we flee. And our individual struggle is only over how long we are going to stick with our prudish little hang-ups and our narcissistic little reticences before we finally and willingly open ourselves and surrender to him. As John Donne did when he wrote his holy sonnet, X I V. Batter my heart, three personed God, take me to you, imprison me, for I, except you, enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me, 